Hey, everybody. Oh, this is, I love this. This feels amazing. <laughs> Sorry that I'm like in between like in shock because you know me, it's impact over numbers every day. So it's like, it doesn't matter how many people's in a room. I'm just very appreciative that everybody's here. Um, and I appreciate, yeah, I'm hoping everybody enjoyed the little, little networking aspect of us just kicking in and just chilling. Um, yeah, my name is Anthony Obas, right? Yeah, that's my name, right? I thought it was my name, right? Um, yes, I think, yeah, I think he's just there. Oh, no, he's just watching, okay. Um, yeah, my name is Anthony Obas, uh, author of Shifting Your Music into a Career, Volume 1, uh, event curator, artist coach, uh, that, this, bada bing, bada boom, right? Why, why, why not? We're from New York, so why not say bada bing, bada boom, right? Um, so today, you know, shout outs to the New York Public Library, right? Shout outs to Maya, right? We got to give one to Maya and Miranda, like they, they really hooked us up with this one. Um, and today, I really just wanted to have a conversation with you about my book. Um, just taking some topics from the book and just being able to explore various topics that, you know, that are relevant to today's music industry and the DIY standpoint, right? Because I think like, there's a lot of things and you mind if I, I can curse my, I can curse, right? I can curse, right? Yes, I could curse. Yeah. Um, there's just a lot of, give it reasonable, right? I think that's the move, but I think there's just a lot of bullshit within the industry these days. And um, my job is to constantly research um, and figure out the loopholes and uh, the five in, in this industry, right? So a little background about me, been doing music for five, not been doing music competition, but doing music business for about five years now. Um, you know, I started off doing radio. Uh, I did radio for about a year. Um, then I switched over to doing blogging. In between those five years, I was doing my, uh, my research in the music industry. So studying, you know, the various sync, you know, the various different royalties, the various different live aspects of live performance. I was looking at branding. I was looking at all of those in the nine yards, right? And um, then I got into artist coaching slash management. Then I got into event curation. And then I got into writing a book, right? And, you know, since then we've been moving the book. We've, we've given talks at, you know, DePaul University. We've given at Nazareth College. Uh, we've also given at Riverside Community College. Um, and currently, like, I'm researching, you know, how to create, like, a better MC type of style. So if you want to know what I do full time, like, an MC bar mitzvahs and, you know, basketball tournaments. And, yeah, that's, you know, you, know, you got to get it by the doctor. It's the bread and butter, right? You need it. You need it. So, um, so all of that plays a huge picture in, you know, where we at today, right? And my goal for today is really to take a few chapters from my book and just, you know, talk about it, how it relates to today, right? Because my book is written, was written in 2017. We're living in 2023. A lot of things have changed in my book, right? From just the streaming payout, it only, it only changed like a, 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 a what is it, one thousandth of a penny? Like now it's at four, <laughs> you know what I mean? But this, the argument is still the same, like, right? The argument of, you know, buying is still essential, right? Versus streaming, right? This idea of branding yourself from an imagery point, right? Of how to like, brand yourself to the point where you don't have scammers, where you don't have talent buyers, right? Scamming you, right? Um, and we talk about visceral, kind of visceral factors. Um, so like visceral factors is like behavior economics, but we'll talk about that. Um, and then social media, right? I think these days we, you know, as artists, we focus so much on our social media presence, right? And I've seen this multiple times where, again, no sub to anybody, but you know, there's a lot of blue check people that just can't sell tickets to shows. Like I'm being quite frankly, right? Um, yeah, you know what? That is a sub. There's no sub. There's a perfect sub for that, right? Um, but and I look to to take you know take that out of the picture. So, so that's what we're here for. This. So the first question I want to answer here today is basically is how like how like why do artists right? always get scammed from promoters, talent buyers, and also radio personnel, right? So for one of the things I want to start off, let's go to the book. I think that's the best way to start with the book, right? So I think about, every time I think about is Frank Ocean, right? Everybody knows the story of Frank Ocean, right? Frank Ocean wanted to come out with Blonde and, you know, it's, you know, he's in this label deal and he had to drop two projects and then he dropped Blonde and now he hasn't released music in a long time, right? Um, when we are as artists, we have this, this kind of like urgency to try to release, right? To try to release 
all of that, right? Um, and it seems to be, we don't really be patient actually with our releases. You know, I think that's, actually, no, that's the question we need to answer, the release, the kind of like, why do artists get tired on release? That's the question, there we go. Why do artists get, you know, tired on release, right? Because one of the things with Frank Ocean is like, Frank Ocean hasn't, I think he dropped maybe like two singles, like little loosey goose, but he hasn't dropped a full project because technically I don't think he's ready to drop a project, right? I don't think he's very capable of going through the touring, going through the whole PR campaign, going through the idea of sync, right? I mean, like, look at, you know, Kendrick, right? Kendrick took Damn and was it 2017, right? 2017, and it took him five years to drop, you know, you know, Mr. Morale, right? We look at SZA, right? SZA Control, right? Now, you know, she has this other project, five years. So why does it take them five years upon release? One of the things I've noticed with a lot of artists emerging is that they'll put so much like into like the production side of things, right? You know, your work, you know how it works, right? You get inspiration, you know, you're like, oh my God, they got a story, got to write it down, right? Um, and you'll get inspiration from the stories, right? Um, better brother. Um, so you'll get inspiration from like the stories, right? So you get inspiration from the stories, you'll have like an idea budget, right? You, you know, then you mix and master, right? And then you'll go through the whole composition of the beats, right? And you go through this process, it could be an album, right? The album will take like 10 tracks, right? But what I've noticed with a lot of artists is the album comes out. And again, this happens to me too, but it's just like, you're tired, right? Like you're just drained because you put so much of your money financially and all your time into the project. But by the time the project comes out, you don't really have like, you don't really have any effort to like release, to like promote, like do a PR campaign, doing live performance, doing footage. You don't have a lot of, you don't have a lot of energy, right? And in that time period, I always tell artists during this time period, you have to take a break right? You just created a full body of work, right? You just created a full body of work, right? You have to take a second and press pause. Why? Because in that situation is you was trying to explain the experience, right? You then have to repivot yourself and then live through the album with your audience, right? You have to communicate that with your audience, right? Because the only way for you to live through that project is to communicate that through PR, playlisting, you know, live performance footages, right? Um, even like reaching out to Instagram influencers, right? Like shout out to my homegirl, Olivia from um, Overlook, but she does reviews on her platform where she basically takes albums and reviews them because that's the new thing, right? Like no one's reading blogs anymore. Like people are now looking on the presence of Instagram, TikTok to see if a project is really good, right? If that makes sense, right? So in my book, I always tell people like, yo, you need to figure out what you are capable of right? Dropping an album, an album's length in terms of product maturity, it's usually about like nine. It's like, I always give it nine months, right? But in these days and age, like albums drop every other month, right? And the only way you're focusing on an album, you probably focus on three tracks and then call it a day, right? But that's not how it should be. You know what I mean? Like, did you fully explain that full album, the concepts, the themes of it, right? We need to stop looking at music as a product and start looking at music as a campaign. Right. Yes. What you're saying, because I come from a different era. Yeah. And why? And I say this is the digital age. Right. To be a theater performance with different politics. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, there's something that's the basic truth in a creative person, no matter what time, no matter what era. It just struck me. First of all, you mentioned one. Yeah. He created the afternoon function. Yeah. We've become the, the we are the creators of Latin. The least thing we want to be concerned about is money. Right. Yeah. Snap to that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Money talks nobody wants. Yeah, it's the thing, right? So many artists and all all the media. Right. Right. No, no, but, but, but no, but yeah. But you have some kind of a criteria. Mm -hmm. I mean, say, well, they are. 
exactly what are your credentials to tell? What is your what is your track record? What are you going to do? And how much do you want me to put up front? Where am I going to get this financing from? And I'm going to put reliable sources in here. Yeah. Preferably not your own pocket book. Right. Right. Who want not to go best and show it? Your own money you look for agent for angels. Angel investors. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to go to the library so it's because I had to issue the public libraries. If you go to corporate, if you go in the individual and look up and look up, they are finances. Do they have lawsuit? Do they have credits? Mm -hmm. If they have lost in their back of see what they're having. Yeah. Uh yeah. <laughs> our, our former <laughs> President, excuse me. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Can we have a QA section at the end? So, okay, if we let Anthony finish it. No. But how do you know if I mention something around and mention one of the small people? It is very important. As you're speaking, I'm here, and we talk about all this putting at the project. Right. Can we be exhausted? Yeah. Afterwards, and you made a very good point. Yeah. Rest because you have to process through what you did. Yeah. You, I mean, that only stops with rest and objectivity. Right. Like and take. Um, that takes time. It takes time. It's, it's not that you want to drop a project or a Because it's time. It's so, and that's the and I love it because that's the purpose. Well, is you you can't you can't and that's the thing. You can't, and that's the pur purpose of like, can I be a Frank Ocean, right? Like you got to figure out what to engage in terms of dropping creatively. Like, you know what I mean? Like, can you go on a month to month run? Like Russ dropped, what is it? 52 songs in, in 52 weeks. And I'm just sitting there like, that's a lot. Like, you know what I mean? Like who's, 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 who's putting the money up for that? You know what I mean? Like who's doing that, right? Like now you got artists these days that are putting up 365 days of content. Well, they're not generating new content every day. They're posting old content. So they're recycling content. Like, you know what I mean? So constantly distributing content on a, on a constant basis with no PR, no marketing and no like support. Like that's tiring over time. You know what I mean? Like that is tiring. That's why I always tell people like when you are done with a product, like shifting your music into a career, the first volume was done in 2017. I didn't drop it all the way into 2019 because I needed a full kind of break from the book itself to really live in the project, I had to figure out my marketing strategy. I had to figure out my PR. I had to figure out what I was going to do. And I mean, look, I'm still on, it's, it's been since 2019. What is it? 2023 is four years. I'm still figuring out new loopholes to marketing, right? I, I didn't even think about coming to a New York public library, right? But these are the things that you need. You need to step away from your art for a second after finishing the product and then figure out how do I market? Who's your target audience? Who am I going for, right? So that's why Can I Be a Frank Ocean? It's, a, it's such a very important chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters, to be honest. It's very short short but it, it works it just it works right and you play on you talk about this you know the money part right and i want to transform to like the other part of the the other part of my question i talked about this idea of visceral factors right so not to be a geek but like yeah i'm a geek it don't matter like whatever right so visceral factors so i studied behavior economics back in like college, right? And behavior economics talks about, not about what makes money, but the why, the psychology of money, right? And one of the things is you think about why do people spend? Why do people invest? It's because of visceral factors. Visceral factors, another synonym for it, it's emotions, right? And it's transforms, it's here, right? And one of the things that I love about, you know, visceral factors in the industry, you really see how they scam artists and it's talent buyers music agents, right? Like, uh, what else? Like labels, right? How they use visceral factors. So I, so over the, the last four years, I've identified like two visceral factors that are very important. Scarcity, right? And also I think opportunity cost, right? They kind of run in the same, in the same realm, but I think scarcity, right? I think with artists is it's the lack of, no matter what you put of, you take the lack of and fill in the blank. It's like, you're willing to pull a trigger on a lot of things, right? So in 2020, I realized that Jada Kiss was doing a campaign, Busta Rhymes was doing a campaign where they were DMing artists $500 to do a feature on a mixtape. I'm like looking at 2020, who still does mixtapes on Spinrilla? Like if you really want to give an artist a platform, like 
put it on streaming platforms, right? Like if you really stand by the integrity of that artist with your integrity, put it on streaming platform, put it on Spinrilla, that piff, right? That's a throwaway. So I was like, I was like curious one day. I'm like, let me just look at this like whole Spinrilla. It was 48 tracks, right? 48 tracks of just artists I never knew about. But you had Jadakiss in the middle of it. This is Jadakiss, right? And if you do the math, 500 for a feature times 48, I did the math. It was enough to pay rent, like $2,000. I was like, wow, I should have thought about that. But the why, why did why do artists spend that type of money, right? It's one, because it's the name, right? It's Jadakiss, right? Big hip hop name, whatever. But it's also a lot of artists fear that they're never going to reach to his status, right? So they'll invest the $500 and then be like, well, I'm comfortable with that because why? I got JD Kiss's name. When realistically, you're not really identifying the real problem here is that you're scared that you're never going to reach to that component. That shouldn't be, we shouldn't be aiming as artists to reach JD Kiss's model, right? My book is all about, my, my book, my business model is about sustainability. It's not about making a million dollars on a constant basis, but it's really about how do you make $50,000 every, every year off of your music? That's really the business model that, that people are not realizing. So you have to mentally retrain your, your, your mind here to kind of say, okay, if $50,000 is the goal, divide that by 12. I'm looking at what, $4,000 every month per se off of just music, right? If we think about all the different types, all the different revenue streams, touring, merch, you know, royalties, right? And all that other stuff. Yes, it might get you close to 50,000, but it's not gonna get you to $50,000, right? You have to think like an entrepreneur. Right. And this is what goes to my my very, very first chapter of Mirror Mirror of an Artist. Right. If we look at a lot of musicians within the industry, they're not music heavy. They're entertainers. Let me take a further step. They're entrepreneurs. Right. We have to stop training our minds and thinking that we're just musicians. No, we're entrepreneurs. We have to tackle this from a different standpoint. We're in the entertainment world. Right. I was telling you the earlier today, it was like if music is the nucleus right, of the entertainment industry. We need to start making money off of the different other, of the different other aspects of the industry, film, sports, um, fashion, right? Like all of that has a huge influence in music theater, right? Like I didn't realize that composition, like orchestra, I went to a play the, the, oh, a couple of weeks ago and I didn't realize like they was like, we got paid to do that stuff. I was like, what? Like black, I don't know, does how many people know the artists like Black Thought? Yeah. Like Black Thought has a whole play on like this whole, this basically is about mel melatonin, you know, like the whole skin and like how when he took like this pill, it's very good, it's very good play, but he took a pill and he's became white and it's like, well, but he did like a lot of the song composition and got paid. And I didn't think about it. If again, music is the nucleus, then the theater became like the cell membrane or whatever other parts of the cell. I forgot my biology class sessions, but that's okay though. But does that make does that make sense, right? So we need to start mirroring our brand that people that are, are kind of like our influences, right? Like my influence in terms of music is definitely like Black Thought is one of my favorite like artists. Like there's hands down, there's like he's an entrepreneur. He comes to interviews with a three piece suit at Hot ninety seven, right? Like it's kind of legit though. I like it though. You know, like if we look at sports, I have a very Stephen A. Smith approach where I'm yelling at people, right? Like you need to take parts of like successful people in the entertainment industry and apply that to your brand, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? So that's the only way for you to kind of get out of there, to expand yourself, to gain further exposure, right? You know, to get further of an experience. If you take samples of everybody's, you know, artwork, add that to you, one, you'll be, it'll be a lot easier for you to like gain new fans. You know what I mean? Because then people can identify, yo, he gives me D Diddy vibes. I've gotten the Diddy vibes a lot. And I'm like, I do not want to be scamming people. Like Diddy is me, mean, but that's not me. I'm all about like peace and love and all that other stuff. You might see in this picture, like you see me with a couple of, you know, this is like Leah, like, you know, she's amazing. Like there's a couple of heavy industry people that I've met off the power of just my strength, right? Like, um, so that then comes from mirror, mirror of an artist, right? Kind of like look yourself in it in the in the mirror and say, who is the true embodiment of my art? Like who is the basis of it? And how do I project that to somebody random that I don't know of? Right. So I'm projecting a very different, like, or like I'm more chill now. I, the other days I would be with like a little turtleneck, little like suit. I would came dripping. But now I'm like, I'm on my really like ever since I've been to LA, I don't know if, ever since I came from LA, I've just been very on LA vibes and you know, just like chill, relax you know, come to New York and like come to create. I don't know. I feel like New York has become like a very like 
artsy, creative LA spot. You know, everybody knows everybody, but um, so that's kind of, is it right? Any questions by chance? I, like, does everybody understand like these concepts, right? Like, yes. Thank you for saying your biblical concepts. There are many reasons that's wrong with you. Mm. Like, it's not just not allow ourselves to be musicians. Right. But that to, to think on a broader level, to look at yourself and say, well, this is, where is my strength? Right. What is, what is, what is my strength? And how can I expand that? Um, yesterday, there was a wonderful program, something that I really even view a virtual reality. This is not my. Oh, program. you start tapping into the metaverse, huh? Right. She wants to uh, uh, interact, be interactive, not just to you interfacing with it. Right. Click, it click something in my right side of the brain and start doing the entertainment industry. Ultimately, whatever you put forth as an artist, I look at each other, you want to connect with the young. Yes. Yes. Oh, you have. So, yeah. How, how does the audience? Can that, that, it, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is this is maybe the future. Right. Right. And. and and right now we're in a hybrid, I mean, like, I think right now we can all agree we're in a very hybrid mode, right? Like you can't disregard not using some type of virtual component in your marketing. Like there's no way you disregard that. You cannot disregard that at this point. Like even at shows these days, right? Like I tell talent buyers, I'm like, why are you not live streaming your shows, right? Like, let's keep the stack. Like if you, if people can't tune in, you know, because they can't make it, but they tap in through live stream, let them tap into live stream. You're still getting a bigger audience that marketing yourself like that. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, go ahead, boss. I just, were you still talking? Oh, no, you go ahead, go boss. I kind of just have a comment about one thing that you said about yeah. the mirror, mirror artist. Yeah. For myself, for a very long time, I was so hyper-focused on I gotta be an artist. I gotta be an artist. I only gotta do that. And I only gotta do that. And recently I kind of discovered where like I like helping people. Yeah. So I look at people like Master P, right. Side Gun, Jay-Z, who were like, yeah, they in Dr. Dre, yeah, they did their own art, right. but they also, you know, they built their brand solely, like their brand expanded because they pushed the culture. They yes. push the culture more. Yeah. They were still able to do their art, but they also helped the culture. By producing, by starting labels, and by doing that, it actually helped them just get bigger than they actually could have been. Exactly. No, you're right. No, you're right. And you're not. You're not lying about that. Like even like. I have a friend that's, he started a nonprofit, a 5013C. There you go, 5013C, there we go. Like he started a nonprofit that makes he, his music is funding for mental health, like a foundation, right? Like, again, these are the topics that we need to start happening, that having those conversations, pushing very cultural changing factors. So you're absolutely right. And again. I agree with what you're saying. Like, we should just look at one thing. We should implement, like, oh, like, like you said, like you have Stephen A. Smith. Right. Or like this, this, like. It changes me so like so narrow and right. things, right? You should look, you should look all over the place because not to cut you off, but like I've seen this with like talent buyers and like they like, oh, like again, talent buyers will give you a uh, proposition where they'd be like, sell 20 tickets at $20. And I sit there and I'm like, are you serious about that? Right. Like I can literally do an art an art show, like an art gallery. Shout out to my man V though. Uh that's Victor right there. But um, like Victor just did a show out in the Bronx where it was an art gallery, but it's like art complementing art. He had also like people performing. Like, why would I give you four hundred dollars easily out of my pocket? That because I'm working out selling tickets, not getting that back. That's that's kind of crazy. I didn't even get a percentage of that cut, right? Because you just provided me the space. I could just use that four hundred dollars, get my own space at that wow. point. You know what I mean? Like I could have done that, and I can complement the art. Right, because I'm not always inspired by music. I'm gonna be real with you. I'm not always inspired by music. I get inspiration from so many different things. Like I got inspiration from the Nutty Professor. Um, there was just one clip. There was this one clip where, like, I don't know if everybody remember this, but Eddie Murphy is like going at Dave Chappelle, and at that point, I'm like, well, Dave Chappelle looks so young at that age, right? But it's like Eddie Murphy had the platform, 
right? And that was Dave Chappelle's cameo. And I'm like, from a from me as a creative, I have to start like doing that for other creatives. I have to start, you know, putting people that are starting to develop into that position so that I they can come up as well too. Because who knows, they might be greater than me, which is perfectly fine. Like we could do some banging greatness movies, right? So, you know, that's a good, and like I said, back to this whole thing about the, the second question, like the visceral factors, right? The lack of, the lack of resources, the lack of confidence, the lack of those things. If you start to really look at the, the inspirations that come from you, the music, the film and all those stuff, you start to get more confidence where you now look at the self-interest of yourself, right? Where you can now tell these talent buyers, these people that work at Hot 97 that's charging you $800 to spin their record, but not paying you on the back end. Uh, we don't want to talk about that, right? But, you know, you don't want to, well, we will talk about that, but um, they don't want to do that. It's because you don't have that self, that self-confidence that you need that. So Mirror Mirror of an Artist eliminates all those those visceral factors, right? It limits all those things, right? The lack of confidence, the scarcity that you're not going to make it, right? Um, you know, we live in an industry where there's a ton of artists and you're trying to figure out how to differentiate yourself. Well, the best way to differentiate yourself is to look at some of the other greats, right? And sample that to make yourself greater, right? You know what I mean? So, um, all good. I'm going to move to like my third, the third and final uh, question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what he's telling you can apply to all art forms as well. Yeah. I'm also video. Just like he said, I follow people more successfully. I follow people on editorial. I follow people who are at the moment showcasing photography. And I'm like, I'm not going to copy your blueprint. I'm not going to call you my competition. I'm only going to look at you as an opportunity to learn about my industry. All right. Because in New York City, we're too in the mind space of compete, compete, compete. I'm better than you. Right. Or he might be better than me, or she might be better than me, or they might be better than me. And everything is an opportunity to learn. Yeah. 100%. You know, so. All right. No. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I love what you said, uh, what you just said. It's not just, you have one art form, it opens, especially visual, it's not to open you up to other art forms. And then um, artists and particularly young people like this have been started. Mm -hmm. need a sense of community. Yes. Uh, yes. Support from yourself. Uh, there's always been, if you look at them like in the 30s, most of the people visual, like Picasso and the Greek and all these, all these people who met in Europe, but they were a they were community. Right, right. So and you need you need to to see. Your art in another place. Yeah. Uh, the performance space is not a necessarily stream. Right. Sometimes theater began in the street. Right. Yeah. You forget about that. Yeah. Yes. Right. 
I love it. So I'm going to go to my final question because uh, we got like, make sure I open up for Q&A. But it, I talk about social media in my book. It says, snap me, then I'm gone, right? So I don't have Snapchat anymore. So I think I'm a little too old for that, right? Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, you know what I mean? But, you know, in my book, I wrestled with Instagram versus Snapchat, right? And I say, you know, why are people always trying to focus on Inst or Snapchat to kind of gain reach, right? Instagram is the best way to gain reach, right? Now you have reels these days where, you know, everybody's just, now they have this whole new system now where it's just reels heavy, like reels is reels is real. Like how real can we be? No pun intended. Um, but the reels is, the, you know what I mean? Like, um, but reels is the main factor these days. Like your photos don't even hit like they used to, because it's like, you gotta be real. You gotta have the visual components of everything, right? Um, IG now they have they kind of stole the, the stole the UX UI experience of Snapchat with these close friends uh, uh, positioning right. You have topics every time you drop reels. You have to put topics in. You be honest with you, the hashtags don't work like they used to. I see people throw like thirty hashtags now these days, and I'm like, it doesn't work like it used to. It doesn't because now it's like now they're tailoring it's, it's algorithmically right. They're categorizing everybody in these topics right, and it's hard for you to kind of you know launch your brand and gain the awareness, gain the interest, getting people to just consume right. Like the fact that y'all came out here, like y'all didn't consume the book, but y'all just came out here. Like y'all consumed time. Like y'all took effort out your time to come out here that's that means a lot to me right because that means that my brand is oh, you're aware of my brand you're interested like you you never met me out today but she's like i'm gonna pop in I'm gonna pull up, right and that's that's but that's the thing awareness interest can cons consume right social media is not supposed to be a platform where we consume and that's the problem these days the 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 IG is made simply for shopping and consuming. That's not the purpose of IG. That was never the pro process of social media. The, so the process of social media was for people to be aware, right? To be aware, to know what you're doing, right? It's not for them. You are supposed to keep dropping content where they become interested, where they have conversations like this, right? They're interested. They want to know more about you. Right. That's when you start. And how do you get people to become interested in you? That's where you start giving out the free sample tastes. Right. If this is like a food if a food market. You got to give them a food, a little niblet of the of the chicken. Right. You know, I, I like to go to food tasting because I'm like, well, it's free food and it's sampled. So I'm like, why not? Right. But you got to give them a taste of things. Right. You invite them to the show. You invite them for coffee. Or I invite them to think. Again, the goal is not to like consume, but the goals for them is to be interested where they want to be a community. A community. Then if they consume, that's on their choice, right? Like I'm not, I'm not forcing down, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. Like if you want to buy it, buy it. Like if you don't got the money, donate what you got, keep it pushing. But the message is still going to keep the same. You know what I mean? Like I'm not, my strategy is not heavy money, right? It's like, I'm focused on wearing your interest about being a sustainable artist. That's my interest, right? My thing is understanding the industry, right? So when we're using social media these days, we need to start raising awareness and interest and stop looking at consuming. But we also need to stop focusing our strategy on social media heavily, right? Like we could connect with people on social media, but our focus should not be heavily on on trying to drive a sale via social media, right? We have other platforms of way of communication. To this day, shout outs to this book called Contagious, but Contagious also talks about the key component of marketing, which is word of mouth, right? Word of, we're missing word of mouth these days. We're missing going to the streets, right? I was talking about this the other day, like you have artists focusing on paying $250 for a playlist. Who's really listening to the song? Who's really listening to the song? What about go back in the 90s? Go back to like the early 60s, right? Where people were bringing in sound systems, where they were bringing sound systems into the space and you heard the music and you could give the live review. Whatever happened to just bringing like a live band where you used to do the covers in between just like the actual original because it's hard, you know, not to say like all originals I like, you know what I mean? Which is true, you don't like all originals, but at least don't want a cover in there can give me like a little taste of like, all right, I know what this person's about. I, you know, I can like one aspect of that performance, right? Um, which is kind of funny because I, yeah, I was like, when I used to think about covers and set lists, I was like, is that gonna work? I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? Like, even you know that, right? Like, you know that. I never, I never thought it worked, but over time, I realized like people just have a familiarity. It brings them back to the old days, and then you punch them with the original because it connects. Like, that's a crazy connect. I was like, wow, I didn't think about that, right? Like, and again, kudos to you, right? Like, kudos to you on that one. Um, but we need to stop focusing on social media as being the strategy of our marketing, right? We need people's word of mouth. Like I, these days, I don't really talk these days, right? I talk a lot, but like 
I don't usually do a lot of the talking, right? You know what I mean? Like, the, you know what I mean? I don't really do that. Like people speak for me. And I think that's the best way of marketing. I don't have to be in the room and people not speak about me. And that's the thing, like, you know what I mean? Whether in a good way or a bad way, I still take the promo, right? Like, you know what I mean? I still take the promo, right? I still take the promo because you can say I'm a good person or you can say I'm a bad person. At least you're going to go on IG and I'm going to look at, you know, that caption, what is it? That little, that's like a little category. It's like profile visits. I know you would be that one to visit me somewhere. You know what I mean? Um, but we need to stop focusing on social media. We got to get back to the word of mouth, right? Like I have flyers here. I, I went in Brooklyn all throughout last night, hanging them up in the local delis, right? Um, you know, I was, you know, I do email marketing, right? So like I do, like I do email marketing, right? It took me five years to build it. But every time I had a show, when people stop at the door, they're signing up their emails. I take that, put it into my database, boom, easy money, right? I don't drop it like every day. Oh, there you go. There's everybody say hi, DJ 500K. Okay. So, um, but um, what was I saying? Um, I forgot. Oh yeah, social media, right? Social media, right? So we need to start word of mouth. If word of mouth is the premises of social media, it's if word of mouth, no, if word of mouth is our basis of things, right? We need to look at SMS marketing. My next five years, again, I did five years. I'm, I'm still here. A lot of people are not here doing that. No sub to them, but like, I'm doing like mad shade of people, but it's okay. <laughs> but I've been doing this for five years. I spent five years focusing on email marketing, right? Just every show, whenever someone stops at the door, sign up on an email. Every time I vent by, I get a pre-sale, take that email, put it in a database, an Excel sheet, right? These next five years for me, I'm work focusing on SMS marketing, right? Because people don't, people don't read, right? People don't read. I mean, people don't, I love, I would love people to read, but people don't got time to read these days. So why not go SMS? You have a day of an event because everybody's looking for, it's this new like energy. Everybody's looking for something to do these days, right? Like even you said, he's like, I'm looking for something to do. Well, if you have an SMS marketing, you could just drop it the day of, and they'll just change their reader. If you that influential, people will redirect their whole plans and just come out. You know what I mean? They'll redirect. That's the power of word of mouth. Like word of mouth should be the premises of your marketing. Everything else is just like the bread and butter at that point, right? Like it's just the bread and butter. Um, it's so crazy. I also thought about ringtones as a, a funny thing. Like just doing like an old boss man ringtone, be like, pick up the phone, like as a ringtone to sell to people for like 30 cents. Remember like back in the days with the CDs and they used to have the 30, and I'm like, I miss those days where you just have the ringtone and just be like ring it in on the, I had the, Nokia, was it the Nokia phone? The little, the little Nokia? Yeah, yeah, you remember? Like, but like, that's what, it used to collect royalties and on top of that, it used to do, you know, collect, used to collect royalties and on top of that, it's good form of marketing. Like imagine your phone ringing and it's your mother and be like, please don't call me back. Like that's the ringtone. Like, you know what I mean? Like, but that's the thing we need to do is like, go back to our old days of, of marketing, right? Go back to the nineties, early two thousands, get street there and then use our social media to raise awareness or we're entering into markets that we don't know, like the Philadelphias, the Londons, use that as a way to, to premise the conversation. We have so many different technologies that allows us to bridge that gap. Let's not use social media as the one premises of everything. Yeah. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's me. Any questions, concerns, comments? That's it. Those are, those are just the taste. Those are the taste. Um, those are the taste. Yeah. Um, hey, people on Zoom. I, did you want to put something in the chat? Ask me a question. Hey, I just had to say hey like that. I keep forgetting. Just drop it in. Hey, it's it's so it's so interesting like doing the virtual. If you have any questions, tap in. Um, do you have any questions for like, anything? I can also tap in just quickly in other chapters that might be of interest for you as well too. Yeah, Bryce. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just providing value for your audience. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm feeding you at that point. Like I stop, I stop. This is the one thing I, I tell people: we overthink our content. These days, I'm just like, I don't really care. I'm just gonna drop on you. Like I let it. Like I'm gonna just drop. I, you know what I mean? Like you want, want you want this song? I'm drop. You want this video? Drop. Like, I'm just, I'm just going to have fun. You, you want, you want to see me on the toilet? Drop. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just going to start dropping content. You know what I mean? Because, because it's just like, why am I overthinking it? You know, you know who I'm about, you know, my value, you know, where I stand in life. You know what I mean? Like, if this is what you want, give the people what they want. We don't, 
tail we don't tailor our marketing strategy to people's needs and wants. We 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 strategize our marketing to our needs and wants because it's like Maslow's self fulfillment. Like we fulfill ourselves by seeing our content out there instead of strategically coming up with content that's going to feed the people. You know what I mean? Like there's there's a difference between that. There's a difference. You know. So any other questions? I, 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 hey, oh my, oh. How would you advise using social media alongside the email and SMS marketing? That's a, and as far as building our brand through word of mouth, how do you suggest tapping into the local scene? Well, Wendell, you are tapping into the local scene currently. Well, so tap in with all of us here. Um, you know, I have email anthony.obuzz at gmail.com. But in terms of social media, I say always come up with a social media schedule, right? I say come up with a social media schedule of the content that you're that you're about to have, right? So let's say you have a campaign. So right now, I just finished my New York Public Library campaign, right? So I'm now people want to see like the photos of the talk. People want to see the visuals, right? So like we recorded this whole conversation. That's a YouTube joint. That's YouTube reels right there. On top of that, like there's photography. Like we're all going to take a photo here in the scene, but people want to see that. I've already I've already focused my social media in terms of a campaign. What is the the what is the main focus? What is the main thing that people want to look at, right? So for me, throughout my whole social media page, I've been promoting New York Public Library. I'm going to recap the New York Public Library with photos, videos, and this. I'm done. After that, I'm ready to go on to a new campaign, right? I'm ready to go on to a new campaign that's shut. So if you can use social media as a way of camp, as a more of a campaign and scheduling various different posts that, or just looking at previous posts that you had and kind of picturing in terms of it as a campaign, then it allows you to like now further promote that. I think cross promotion is another thing, right? Tagging people, right? People don't tag people in like a lot of things, which is kind of crazy. I don't, I just do it subliminally because I'm like, I'm thinking about you, I'm talking about you, right? And people would be like, you didn't want to tag? I'm like, I'm still, I still love you though. <laughs> Right. Um, make sure you know to do cross promotion. I also think also seeing if you could be on other people's feed and posts. Right. I think another thing that IG has is like a collaboration aspect of it. I mean, I collaborate with Victor a ton. Like a lot of people would be like, how do I tap in with Victor? I'm like, every time we do a photo scene and stuff like that, I, he's my collaborator. You know what I mean? Once it's done, you know, you might untag or because it's still part of the feed, but that's a good way of collaborating. So um, when do I hope that aided your question there about like social media i say scheduling but also don't overthink the content just hit them and if you think of something creatively hit them you know um but yeah like i said yes it did yeah we ended we answered wendell's conference topic yeah i lo lo appreciate you wendell any other questions i sense preguntas what up brother oh yeah how how is it when I'm still trying to work on my craft and you know what I'm trying to work on my craft? Right. But some like it's very still early in the early stages. And how do you know when you're you're ready and you're satisfied? Or is it is it kind of you'll never be satisfied. You'll never be satisfied. But continue though. Yeah, just like moving on to the next or or yeah, you, so this is a good one. For me, I was ready to drop volume two in 20, 2020. I moved it to now 2023, right? Because I wasn't ready. You know what told me that I wasn't ready? My data told me I wasn't ready, right? I kept seeing people buy the book and I'm like, I'm trying to move on. Like I'm trying to move on past this relationship with volume one, right? Like, but as I, I kept seeing a demand for it, so I can't move on, right? I start getting booked for other gigs. You know what I mean? You also have to understand as an artist, sometimes you just got to put it out, right? At that time and just see what it does, right? And then you can flow with it, right? Exactly. But you really need to take the, whether you take the pause before you drop or you take the pause after the drop, you need the pause. You get what I'm saying? Like you need the pause. You need people to kind of give you the reviews. You need that sample data. Right. You need that because you don't know if it worked or not. If you don't have the sample data, then you can maximize that project even further, if that makes sense. Right. We're moving in this industry where we don't have sample data. We don't even have reviews on the project. And we're still like trying to drop project on project. We don't even know how the first project did. So how are you going to move on if, if you don't really got the data to say if it's valid or not? You know what I mean? So. Um, oh, wait, when Wendell says something in the comments, he says, when you have a body of work, that you say on and feel ready to release, what are the main stops someone should make as far as sending out the project to be marketed, right? First of all, I like that question. First of all, 
when I had, before I had my book, I had like a reading session in Syracuse. I asked like five people to sit down with me and have a reading session. Like, is this a valid point, right? I had my professor, I had, and it was, it was very focus group, right? I had, I had my professor, I had a friend that was doing radio. I had, shout out to Professor Ulf, right? In the music industry as well too. And I had them sit down with me, right? Um, I had them sit down with me. So I sampled that first, right? That was the first thing. So I marketed to them, right? Then after that, I started piling up my PR, right? I started figuring out who do I reach out to? Who do I kind of connect with? Who is my audience? That's what I always say. Who's my audience? Who am I targeting? What is the, not only just from a demographic geography, but what do they do? Like all of, yeah, we go to shows together. Yeah, no, me, how we go, we go crazy, right? Like we go out and about, right? Um, um, oh, he's at Windows at Binghamton. Hey, shout out to Bing. Um, but you figure out that PR, you figure out who is marketed to you, you China, you, you, you have to focus on your immediate circle first. That's basically what I'm saying. Fo focus on your immediate circle before you can even PR to somebody focus on your immediate circle, right? See what they get. Then after that, you reach out to other brands that have the same kind of message as you. You focus on like the, again, so, so for PR, you focus on like, let's say uh, music LA blog, right? They do, they feature a lot of artists. and our Factory is another blog, blog fact, is another blog. I'm, I'm tweaking on a lot of blogs because I have like a whole PR database, which is a lot, but you have that as your PR. You figure out who are the people you need to collaborate with, right? I don't collaborate with a lot of people these days. I used to collaborate with everybody, but now I collaborate with only a few because it's just like, it gotta make sense in terms of branding to, to further push the project. So, you know, when, the, when I said the main stops you should make is first your immediate circle and then see what your immediate circle can do in one degree separation, right? Follow, I think it's like, what a six degree separation these days, right? So I always say work to your first degree separation, work into the layer. Once you get out the layer, one step at a time. So that's my thing. So Wendell, I hope that answered the question. I think we have room for one more question. Yeah, Wendell. Hi. Of course. Um, what kind of other data are you looking for? So you're collecting data on how you know how you get the Apple music, whatever like the book. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, but what kind of data are you looking for besides uh what like how many people are listening? Where are they listening? Because they'll tell you the country, whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you have any specific that you can advise? Yeah. That's yeah. the yeah. one amazing too. Yes. So I think, so I think that's crucial. Yeah, V, that's very crucial. Like, again, all that data is crucial. Like for me, like I take the local, where's, where's the streaming coming from? Like the cities, right? So I take that as data to say potential market penetration for tours. That's how I interpret it. Monthly listeners I take as on Spotify, I always look at like how many people are tuning into me on a monthly consistent basis. How can I maintain that? Right. I look at my followers and I say, okay, how many people are just clicking follow and following the process of me dropping music. But then that's a very important data that V said about like, we don't know, we don't have data on how it feels. So artists are so quick to run, you know, IG ads, you know, YouTube ads very quick, but you don't even have like, how you don't even know how it made people feel. That's the better way of like, you know, consuming the, of advertisement. You can't advertise based on the like, the person's like 21 these days. No, you gotta, you have to go on people's lifestyle. That's like consumer lifestyle, right? So when I look at that data, I look at, you know, monthly listeners, how many, how many people are listening on a month to month basis? That means that, okay, I have to, could I drop on a month to month basis? Like that's good, right? Or then I look at my tour, my cities. I'm like, okay, maybe we can tour it X, Y, and Z, right? Even if it's just the littlest, that's still a possible tour, right? Um, or it's still a part market penetration, right? Like you don't got a tour, but you could do a small pop-up at like a brunch spot and just be like, come meet me at brunch for chicken and waffles. Like, you know what I mean? That's my favorite thing. I like chicken and waffles. Um, but that's what I do. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I had no idea that there was people um, in Alabama. I went there one time and I was just like, I'm just here just to be here. I don't know. I'm from New York. Like, I don't even know, whatever. But like Alabama is becoming a market for me because I've been there once and twice and I've done small curations there, right? You got to pen. And sometimes that data is obscured. Right. So that data is might not be as accurate as you think it is. Right. That's why you just have to say, you know what, screw the data. I'm just going to build my own data at that point. Right. So um, that's how I look at those data. I feel like I'm missing another. Oh, Shazam. I forgot Shazam. I, Shazam on Apple Music uh, radar. But Shazam for me is probably the biggest key of data, which no one talks about. I, I when I, when everybody has like the Apple Music for artists, I look at Shazam. How many people are really interested in researching my song? At, because at that moment it made them feel something. That is that is very key. Shazam music is Shazam on Apple Music is probably one of the top tier data I love. 
because it tells me how many people were interested at that time. They never heard it, but how many people at that time. There's something that made them feel, I need to find out and I need to dig deep. So yeah, that, I forgot about that one. Okay. Yeah. What do you have to say for the artists and people in the room that are just sitting on work right now? What do you have to say for years <laughs> worth of work that we've done? <laughs> <laughs> So I say this, I say, it's a, first of all, it's a process, right? I say that don't feel like you rush, You have to feel rushed to drop on people. Don't feel like you rush. But on another side of it, it's kind of double-edged sword here, right? Like, it's just like, you never know until you try, drop it. Because honestly, honestly, like I dropped this book in 2019. I didn't know where it was going to go. And like, I thought I was going to hold off until 2020 when I'm like in this big label and I got a book and I look good. Well, clearly that didn't happen. Right. So I let it go off in 2019. I was like, well, thank God I did that. Cause I just, whew, I dodged a bullet. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like, you have to be real with yourself again, taking that pause though. Right. Like take that pause. is like, okay, let me try this out and just say, I'm gonna go for it right at that point and see where it is. And to be honest with you, people don't really understand this, but when you go four years out of doing what you do, you can always go back to that project. So even if you didn't give it the best love, you could give it love now, recycle it, reproduce it, rewrite that. Because you know what I mean? Like you have time. The only thing we have is time, right? You know what I mean? Like when we have flexibility, don't let money be the advocate of like where your artistry career. So yeah, but I think that's about it. I have one more question, but I think that's that's answer quickly. Okay, Wendell, I'm gonna hear you. What would you say is the current state of SoundCloud? Because usually it's a platform where people are expecting to hear newer artists. I say that SoundCloud, it's tough, right? It's kind of weird because SoundCloud is a place for discovery. I think these days SoundClouds are more leaning towards like DJ mixes a little bit now. They're more leaning towards more producer blends, right? I think that's more the platform is leaning towards it. If you agree with that, I don't know if you agree. you agree with that, right? Right. So like for as an artist, Wendell, I don't think if you're starting out in terms of music, I don't think you should focus on SoundCloud. One of the best platforms I always recommend local artists to use, emerging just to get their sound out there, is please start off with Audio Mac. Please start off with Bandcamp, right? Start with there first, right? See, Bandcamp allows you to see if you can generate a sale. Audio Mac now allows you for further discovery with artists that are more in your reach, right? And Spotify, you're competing with the Kendricks, whatever. At least with Audio Mac, it's a very good foundation base for you. I, and then again, I still don't think artists should, you know, be putting their music. If you're just starting, I don't even think you should be putting your music out on streaming platforms, right? Because you're competing with too many, right? Start off small, Audio Mac, the, the band camps, start grounded, give people some sales. So uh, Wendell, that was a great question. Wendell, what's been killing? I love Wendell. Um, but that's the end of our conversation for the day. Um, I hope y'all enjoyed it. I hope y'all liked it. Oh, appreciate you, Wendell. Um, Wendell, definitely tap in. Anthony Obas everywhere. Shout out to Lori. Shout out to Melissa. Shout out to Lance. I think there's more people here. Uh, Michael, what's up? Nathan, what's up? And shout out to everybody in the room today, too, as well, too. I do have one, one thing to give for people outside the room very quickly, but shout out to y'all in the Zoom. I will talk to y'all in a few.